everybody. <laughs> you may notice that my co-host is not who she usually is. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I have to do the bit where we actually start the podcast, which is what Lily usually does, and say hello, everyone, and welcome to all the films to be judged before. I'm Katie. That's not Lily K. This is no. Brian, the lovely Brian Pater, who uh, we haven't actually spoken like properly for like a couple of years. <laughs> I would say, yeah, two years back Something in like that. whenever Relator resolved. So, yeah. what, 2021? <laughs> Something like that, yeah. yeah. Is, but it's nice yeah. to see you again. Nice <laughs> to see you too. I like your hair, by the way. Oh, it's thank good. you. I forgot yeah. you haven't seen it. Um, <laughs> yeah, this is about, I've had this for about a year now. Um, <laughs> it suits you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's it, it grows very fast and I have to get it cut every eight weeks, but I, I very much <laughs> prefer it to the long hair. It, probably easier to manage and everything. A little too. bit, yeah. I don't have to do nearly as much to it, and yet somehow I do more to it than I did when I had long hair. It's a sort of strange thing. Um, but yes, uh, as I shall um, mention, Lily isn't here this week. She's um, busy doing a thousand different things, as she tends to do. <laughs> um, but she's got some very exciting news coming up, so you should keep an eye on social media stuff this mm. week for, for, for Lily content. Um, but at the moment, she's working on a play, because, you know, Awesome. <laughs> she's cool like that and all that stuff but yes this week we've got brian and brian you're um lily tells me that you're a very big fan of our show which is very kind i am yes i love what you guys do Aww. i think it's great and i love i just I, I, there's so many i don't know there's there's something really fun about just watching two friends talk about things and know a lot about it and have a very in-depth uh access to the information of what the show's about and the the topics are about i feel like there's i listen to a lot of podcasts where there's kind of like vague like backgrounds but like oh like maybe this thing happened within this season like i don't quite remember but i feel mm. like you guys know so much about what's going on and you keep a good uh like what's what's the a finger on the pulse mm. of the media you discuss which i think is really important um so that's very yeah. kind. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I, I think I find it. I, I have a real thing about, um, you know, if I'm going to be talking about something, I like to make sure that I know what I'm talking about. I really hate yeah. the sort of that sort of. I mean, I'm. It's not like I'm immune to it. I will every once in a while bring up something that I don't know anything about, but I like to make sure that I'm as clear as possible that like I'm talking on something that I don't know that much about. So when mm. I'm talking on something I do know about, I'm like, I am an authority on this thing I'm speaking about. I think that's wonderful. Yeah, no, yeah, I, I think that's, I think more people could do that in real life mm. to a normal day-to-day -day <laughs> conversation. <laughs> yeah, I think, and I think that's probably where it came from as well, because there's I mean, yeah, it's such a thing um, to have people, especially when you're on social media and it feels like everybody needs to have an opinion on something. Yeah. I feel like if I want, if, if it's something huge and intense and like, um i i would much prefer to be able to like read as much as i can from as many people as possible before i have any say on the subjects especially as i feel like i'm a bit of a sponge for that mm. sort of a thing um i like to make sure that like um i've kind of taken everything in and kind of processed it so that i can bring it back out as something that i'm like oh this is something i understand now that kind of thing and if i don't i try not to talk on it at all <laughs> <laughs> it's very wise mm. um <laughs> yeah um, yeah, yeah, I'll please after you. No, I was just going to say, oh, it could be because um, uh, obviously, um, as as I said, you 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 uh, can't form a full fucking sentence. Um, well, <laughs> I can't I, I'm talking. To myself. No, no, I mean we're we're two peas in a pod. If that's the case right <laughs> now, <laughs> so, um, I was just going to uh, nod and say, mm, mm, yeah, this, that's, that's so. what I do in most of. <laughs> right. Um. Uh, we'll just I, do that. Mm. <laughs> yes, I thought it might be a good idea if you introduce yourself to the audience so they get a sense of like who you are, what it is you do, um, all that kind of a thing. Sure. Hi, my name is Brian Pater. I'm from the States, from Portland, Oregon. Um, I'm an actor. Uh, and what, what, who am I? Uh, yeah, just like, you know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> essential dread. Uh, I... <laughs> Yeah, so I, I have a passion for, um, I think, I, I guess, like, the core values, a lot of my, my values come from Lord of the Rings, so, like, that should give you some sort of idea of who mm. I am. I love, uh, I guess, high fantasy and fiction, but with a lot of core elements of care and friendship and, like, heart. Um, so, like, some of my favorite media I've ever seen, Lord of the Rings, mm. uh, I love Penny Dreadful, I think that's just wow. an amazing show, if you've seen that before um yeah penny dreadful is oh. one of those ones because penny dreadful and 
there's another one that I would always get mixed up. And I think I watched the first episode of the other one with the intention of watching Penny Dreadful. And I never got around to actually watching Penny Dreadful. No, I just can't dude, remember what the other one is off the top of my head, though. It's something in this, it's a similar vein of that kind of like um, era of stuff with, um, I, oh God, I really can't remember what it is now. But every time I get them mixed up in my head, <laughs> I bet of- if I Google it, it'll come up as like a related thing. But um, it, please keep going. Was show? It wasn't. Um... Yeah, please, please Google it because there's a couple shows that came out around the same time that I, I they're all like Victorian kind of high fantasy. I'm trying to think of Hemlock Grove. I think it was. I think I think I got those two mixed up. Interesting. I haven't heard of that one. Um, it was on. If I could get this to actually show me what I wanted <laughs> out of it, um, it, I believe it was. Oh, hang on. Yeah, it was a Netflix show. Um, but it had a very similar vibe, lots of like, um, or at least from the outside, not really knowing very much about it, lots of like, you know, murdery, sort of like creepy stuff. But I don't think Hemlock Grove had that element of like, um, uh, fairy tale to mm-hmm. it. Um, I just, for some reason, the aesthetics were close enough that every time I thought of one, I thought of the other. You associated it, yeah. Yeah, that kind of a thing. <laughs> well, it's, but, uh, it's really worth watching. I highly recommend it. At least, mm-hmm. at least the original series, the um, I think what was it, uh, City of Angels mm-hmm. spinoff. I wasn't a big fan of. They, they kept only a couple of the original cast, and it was a reboot, and it just didn't work. It became a strange anthology series, and it lost a lot of the 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 charm and I think the messaging behind it. So, Fair enough. um. But yeah, uh, what what else? I I like long walks on the beach in the summer. <laughs> uh, no, I I um, yeah, I'm a big fan of of, I don't know, uh, like you know shows like Good Omens, like mm. recently Loki, which I just finally mm. finished. Um, things where you think they're going to go one way, but then they kind of prioritize heart and surprise over mm. like the cliches. Um, I'm a big fan of like, there's a show called Slings and Arrows that came out. It was a Canadian mm-hmm. show that came out 20 years ago about okay. actors. It's kind of meta, um, in a theater and how they're so difficult to work with. At least, you know, that was these sets of actors interpretation of working with other actors. And it's just a very heartful show. Um, so yeah, like that's kind of like what I look for in terms of the media I watch and consume. Um, but also like Breaking Bad is cool too. Yes, so, I do love Breaking Bad. That's a fact. You know, I don't trust anyone who doesn't. Yeah, it's just so I honestly, it's it's like I feel like if you get through season one and you're still a bit like, oh, I'm not sure, I can understand it. But if you manage yeah. to make the entire show and you didn't get like yeah. moved by the end of it, I'm like, I don't understand you. <laughs> I know, especially with with Jesse, and then if you see oh, El Camino, like it's just, what a great. I mean, I'm not gonna spoil anything for anyone who hasn't seen it, but what a great just arc, one of the best arcs of any television characters. I and think. such a oh. like. A testament to how good Aaron Paul was, considering that they were like planning on killing Aaron, um, Jesse at the beginning of the first season. <laughs> I know it's crazy. And who who was it? There was the writer's strike that stopped that, right? Is that what it I was? I think a little bit. Yeah, I think because yeah. um, it was only six episodes. Oh god, it would have been around that time as well, wouldn't it? I believe god, I don't so. Even think so. But, uh, but yeah, um, it's just yeah, I um yeah, Jesse's one of those characters that I I, I you know became very very attached to and had them for yeah. uh, a long time. Um, but yeah, no, Breaking Bad is great. I, you know, I never got around to watching. It's not entirely true. I watched, I think, most of the first season of Better Call Saul around the time it was coming out. And yeah. I just never got back to watching it. But I yeah. read everything about it as those like last seasons were coming. So I know a lot of what happened. And I know that it was like really good. <laughs> I just never got around to like, sitting and watching it properly. I know I've heard the same thing. It's it's weird, isn't it? Like a lot of my friends were trying to get into it too. They're like, "Oh, it's so good," and like they dropped off after that as well. I think there's there's just a certain magic that um, Vince was it Vince Gillian Vince Gillian captured with Breaking Bad, and I think for a lot of people he did recapture that with Better Call Saul. But for me, I think for a lot of people, when you don't have that core cast, like you just it loses something. And there's such a there's such an interesting arc of watching Walter White become Heisenberg and become that person and, and stray that line of morality uh, while dragging his whole family and everyone into it, you know, at the same time. And I think you you have elements of that, but it's not the same charisma, it's not the same thing with a character like Saul. You know? But like, as it shouldn't 
be i guess right uh, exactly because exactly. it is it's a different yeah. character it should be a different story because nobody wants you to retread the same ground and i think what he i, I believe that he does very well in better Call Saul is that it's like a real understanding of what a prequel like story needs to be in mm. that it's not about like like the actual events of what leads up to the thing it's just about like what does this mean for where we know that they end up and like how does that color everything that we already know about them how do we learn something new that kind of a thing yeah. um and also yeah. plays in that space of like which i love with 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 stories that kind of like have a predetermined ending where it like really heavily dives into that sense of like tragedy inherent tragedy and like inevitability and like you know that these characters are going to end up in a very specific place and if you care about them along the way that sense of like horror and like you know heartbreak becomes mm -hmm. more you know heartfelt i guess it's like amplified <laughs> it amplifies it, exactly um which yeah. is why i keep pushing lily to watch more black sales which she tells me she is <laughs> like I, I, we have I, to I, talk about it it's one of the I best haven't seen it either i haven't seen it either i i just highly recommend i mean to be fair it might not be the best one to go into at the moment if you're like not in that sort of a, a, a space but it is um some of the best drama <laughs> like it just like and like a storytelling that really it was speak because we were before we started recording we were talking about like meta narratives and all this yeah. sort of thing um it is an incredibly meta sort of piece but in that kind of um like storybook way because it is it, it isn't mm -hmm. it's a it's a prequel to treasure island lily's going to be watching this edit being like for god's sake i am getting <laughs> <laughs> keep bringing this up and I'm like <laughs> you want um, not there <laughs> yeah um but yeah it's a, it, it's a pretty it's a it's a prequel cool story to the events of treasure island but told in this like you know grittier darker way which can sound kind of like the end of the first season play because it came out right around like the big um intense game of thrones like love fest in like 2014 right. so it feels that first season feels a lot like Oh, they're trying to do Game of Thrones, but with pirates in the sort of the way that they're doing the violence and all of the, um, you know, the sex and it's all uh, <laughs> thing. But very quickly, I think into season two, you kind of see where they kind of were that to make the actual story they wanted to make because mm -hmm. it's still mm -hmm. violent and all this sort of stuff. But like it has, it feels more like focused yeah. in, a, in a very specific direction. And it has a lot of very interesting twists for these characters, and I love this sense of like the narrative itself is like a player in the story and it is sort of it is it's a force and it's it's not necessarily bad but it will come after you if you try to like it's, it, really it's, it's sort of, I, I find that kind of device and that framing device to be fascinating um especially if you're kind of creating a horror story i guess in a sense it's not like black sales i wouldn't say is a horror exactly but like it, it creates a sense of horror in places where they, they you really want it. They, I mean, it's just really fascinating to me because you can look at all of the characters and get a sense of like, well, if this person had stayed on this path, mm -hmm. then like so much would have changed, but that would have, wouldn't be the story and because they had to stay on the story path. They couldn't do this other thing. Um, so there's like, everybody's kind of doomed to be <laughs> a certain thing within this narrative and you can't kind of get it, out of that. This is coming from a, a, a person who's never seen the show, but yeah. it kind of sounds like it follows if the monster was the narrative itself. Is that yeah, kind of yeah. I, as much as like as much as I know about it follows, I read, I read that's one of the <laughs> horror movies I read the plot of on Wikipedia. <laughs> I don't think I'd ever be able to do like, actually watching it. I think that's a bit too tense for me. Fair enough. Um, yeah. uh, but yes, very much in that kind of sense, like it's just like this is a thing that exists and yeah. um has to be reckoned with and kind of is alluded to a lot in the story um and there's mm -hmm. the, i mean there's a lot of talk about like how stories are used and like oh the fact the character of john silver in it is so freaking fascinating but i don't want to like spoil it <laughs> so it really should be like um experienced properly yeah. four seasons yeah. all of them excellent <laughs> that's not how, how long are it like 12 episodes per um season? i think or... the first season is eight and then every season after that is 10 so there's 38 so, episodes total um so, that's like yeah. a weekend if you yeah <laughs> um, i think really. they're, they're like slightly long, longer episodes like at like ended, hour right? long episodes ish i think uh, for the most part but like it, yeah it was on, um it was on showtime i think when they when it was on um okay. so like so that gives a sense of like <laughs> the sort of vibe that you might be getting out of it 
um there's someone yeah. too uh penny penny dreadful was also on showtime as well there you actually. go <laughs> yeah 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 um also by the way if you keep hearing like a ding noise mm. in the background i think it's my email and i don't know how to stop that from happening so i apologize i think, I think we'll live <laughs> I'll, I'll i'll settle that for the next time uh but right now i don't want to press too many buttons and get locked out of my computer and then mm. you know, yeah no that's very fair um yeah I don't yeah, think that would happen, but just in case, <laughs> just in case you never know. It's like yeah, this will be know. fine, and then you poke something, and everything goes off, <laughs> explodes, starts yeah. smoking. Yeah, just don't want to deal exactly. with that. Exactly. Um, but yeah, <laughs> um, uh, I'm trying to think of how to transition this properly. Um, so the, the hope is, you know, <laughs> segways are fun. <laughs> um, with you know introducing you here today. Uh, yeah. you're going to be coming back on occasion to to yes. hang out with us so you can kind of be like our periodic guest um uh, uh host Love along live with us which we're very excited about um Thank but obviously just like end of the year everything's very busy we haven't had a chance to to do that as much yet um but for now um our, our the original uh idea for the episode or like plan for the episode kind of went a little bit out the window when they uh revealed that she's got some stuff on so instead we're just going to talk about what we've been watching kind of like we have been doing up until this point so um, <laughs> <laughs> but a little bit i'm i'm saying it with intention now so now it's <laughs> focus yes and right. now 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 the intention has been set what have you yes. been up to recently <laughs> what have you been watching Gosh. Uh, in terms of watching, yeah. yeah. Uh, so I, I watched all the staged, all three seasons mm -hmm. of staged. Very fun. Um, and I watched season one and two of Loki. I've been rewatching kind of on like a, a Marvel TV uh, binge, mm. actually, I, but older school Marvel. So I rewatched Daredevil mm. one. I rewatched Jessica Jones again. Good stuff. Um, another David Tennant show with stage yes you know because uh, i'm 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 very much pushing for us to talk about um doctor who when it comes back so i'm oh, I'm, yeah. I'm in a very i'm I... in a big space where i'm like just very excited at the moment. <laughs> i am too i'm very curious about how that's going to work because they're bringing back you know murray gold and david Tennant, mm -hmm, Captain mm -hmm. Tate and, and um russell t davis before uh nushiti got why it's gonna be really mm -hmm. really interesting to see what they do with that i'm curious how they I'm hoping they stick the landing. I'm sure they will, but it'll be interesting how they interweave that all together. Um, I'm, I'm just, I'm so excited. I don't know. Did you see they they did a little um sketch uh for Children in Need last week? Did you watch that? Yeah, the, for Red Nose Day. So uh, no, for? Children in Need. It's like kind of an annual thing here in the UK. We've got oh, like okay. a little yellow bear um who's like kind of the face of the whole thing. His name's Pudsy, and they do this big, oh. big like telephone night where they do. It's it's very much like Red Nose Day, but it's very specifically okay. for this like children's charity that we have here in the UK. They raise lots of money. They do lots of very silly skits, and and they raise money for kids all over the country. And it's it's a great um thing. Uh, but they tend to Doctor Who's kind of had a long history with with um with uh children in need, and they've done little things. But I watched the clip. And I had this really weird, like, feeling of like, oh, no time has passed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With, with David Tennant coming back. Yeah, just yeah. like it just felt. I was like, oh, of course he's doing this. Why, why would yeah. he be here doing that? Like with that intonation and, and all this sort of like thing. Um, I had it was just a very strange experience. So I can't imagine what the uh, watching these three episodes. But yes, I'm very. Mm -hmm. I mean, touch wood, it's going to hit the hit the landing because like Doctor Who's been, it's been something very important to me for most of my life <laughs> um, me, too. me too it's it's I, I i met got the, the chance to meet david Tennant once he was a really really lovely lovely person and um my sort of white whale of people to meet but i'm also like i feel like it's so much of a thing that i'm like i don't know if i could do it well it was interesting was, yeah i mean like he's I, you know i i there there i've gotten the chance to meet a lot of like well-known people i put that in quotes because mm. for some people they may not be well known mm. um and some of them have not been the most welcoming and, mm. and normal and kind. And I people have their lives and I don't judge it because I don't know what they were going through during that time, whatever. Sure. Um, but uh, when I was waiting in line with my my friend to uh, speak with them, it was just a, a, a very normal person just interacting mm. with people. And just there's a sense of just, oh, it's just a just a nice guy. And so we just had a chat and um, uh, he was really, really just kind and asked me questions back and um, it was just this kind of sense of like, oh, this is just a, a person who's very firmly in his values of being uh, caring to people and yeah. kind of like lives the way that he seems to, to talk about, which is lovely. Yeah. Um, so it's it always makes me happy to see like successful people um, who are kind continue yeah. to be successful. 
Um, so yeah, no, I, I, I totally get like that, that, you know, that thing like, oh, wow, this, it's this person. Cause I've definitely had that before. Um, but it makes me so happy that he's continuing this because I, he's such a good actor, right? Mm. He's such a good actor. So and good. it's interesting because he's one of those people who has never really stopped being Dr. Who, cause he's done so many audio books in the mm. past and guest starring roles in, in the 50th with Matt Smith. Yeah. Um, that it's. even though everyone's aged a bit, because that's how time works, unfortunately, <laughs> yes, it <all> does. <laughs> even for us, um, man, I hate that. Uh, it, it's it's like no time has passed, mm. right? Where he steps into it. And there's something so kind of magical about someone who's not trying to, I'm going to look at things from an actor's perspective too, especially, mm. that he's not trying to recapture it. He's not imitating himself. He's just doing He's he's doing the same thing, but in an updated way, because that's where he's at, it seems like. Yeah. And that's really, really cool with his new experience and new skills as an actor, you know. So it's it, there's something Yeah. fun about it. It's very much it's funny you should mention the audiobooks though, because like I um uh I feel like I've probably mentioned this here before, but like um yeah, I, I mean I've I've been watching Doctor Who since it came back in two thousand five. So yeah. it's been like it's yeah, very much that thing, but it's like that thing. I think it, it's very much the thing that kind of got me into what like or at least interested in like stories it, I can I feel like it's the first thing I can remember being like really attached to and like mystified by and all that sort of a thing um but those I've got a couple of those audiobooks because um there's a, a magazine here in the UK called Radio Times it's like a weekly sort of like Telephone, yeah, you know the way your times, um, uh, and but um, they put out these um audiobooks of some of the Doctor Who novels, um, and my grandma, God bless her, used to um write off to and go get them sent to her because she knew I'd like them, um, and I've I've got three of them that they did like like two thousand six, I want to say something like that, but I, I used to like not sleep very well as a kid, so I used to um and still do now listen to audiobooks to help me like sleep. And I've got like the same audiobooks that I've been listening to for like the past like 15 something years because they're so familiar to me. They're just like, you know, comfort noise. And it's like, I don't need to listen to them because I do know them so well. Um, Yeah. but like it's very much like I've got a couple of them. It's the Stone Rose, uh, Feast of the Round, and the Resurrection Casket. Are those those three are like my like Doctor Who ones anyway? So it, I think that's part of the reason why when I watched it, I was like, yeah, I listen to this most nights. So <laughs> it's kind of like this isn't like it, of course no time has passed for me it's like still so present um it and never leaves you in a lot of ways familiar, it's just always yeah part of your life yeah yeah i just had a friend of mine send me the um uh the um crumbs from you know god knows how many years ago at this point but uh they were playing doomsday and oh it's just like oh i'm just gonna sit here and listen to this for a bit because this is really <laughs> oh <laughs> like it's so emotional It makes me very excited to hear that Murray Gold is coming back and doing more yeah. uh, the oh, music because yeah. it's like, yeah, of course, like, like, it really wasn't the same when he left. No, <laughs> it just wasn't. no, it wasn't. No, I mean, I, I liked some of the things that they did, but like, just there's something so emotional about the themes that he'd write, and there's there's a sentimentality to it that's not too like overly sentimental. It's just that right blend of like active mm. with that sentimentality and. I, I, you know, I'm sure you've heard the, the new theme, Yes. uh, for this. Gorgeous. And it's, it's what a amazing, like morphing of like 10 and like, you know, 14 and probably hopefully 15. Like there's Yeah. just so many different things in it that I'm like, oh, that's like, so Murray gold. Like that's just quintessential, like what he can do with that. Um, he's just a master at that. It really, yeah. I just listened to it and I was like, it just feels like it feels so it's familiar, but more. It's like it's Yeah. just that there's a depth to to it at all. I think just because they've got like a bigger orchestra doing it. I think that's like, but like I don't know. I was just listening to it like, yeah, it still this still gives me goosebumps, actually. I'm so very, very excited about it. When Um when those violins said the da 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 there's that that's such a like for me because like that was very 2005 when it first came out i think Yeah. they dropped the violins for a while or like lessened them i'm like oh it's such a nostalgia hit but it's so it's new too um so i got the goosebumps as well oh yeah Yeah. i can't i can't wait I can't wait. I can't wait <laughs> uh, so and it's so close. As when this episode comes out, it will be in like two days. That's insane. oh my gosh I've been waiting for like three wibbly days. wobbly timey wimey stuff <laughs> but yeah um Yeah, What else have you been watching? <laughs> whatever. I so I've been to the cinema quite a bit recently because my local cinema does um these cult classic nights where they put on some you know well known movies that like uh, uh you know yeah I'm trying to think of what the word I'm looking for is they're not necessarily actually cult classics but like 
ones that people like tout as being like some of the all-time greats. So I saw The Shining recently, mm-hmm. um, which is my first Kubrick movie, if you can believe it. I've never actually hadn't watched any Kubrick movies before that. And I, I liked it. I could see uh, um, Jack Nicholson is fantastic in it. Um, obviously, he, there. I didn't expect him to be quite so funny. There is something very funny about his performance uh, in it, which um, I wasn't expecting. But I do. I think there's something about knowing what Shelley Duvall went through in the filming yeah. of that movie that kind of goes to go. Well, this movie's not very nice to women <laughs> at all. No, there's there's something about it that feels after like knowing all that knowledge, it's it's exploitative and yeah. it feels it feels kind of icky. <laughs> like, it does. I, I, was like, I don't know if there's a better word for that. But... No, I think that's a great word for it. Um, <laughs> I it was yeah, it was like I I did enjoy it, and it, like watching it, I was like, this is an incredibly well made film. You know, especially when you yeah. when you spend so much time like watching um, movies from that kind of perspective, and especially from like you know going to film school and like learning how like people put together movies it's like okay you can really tell that like there was a lot of intention and understanding of like a vision that went on here but there is still a sense of like mm, yeah. shit yeah it's that ick it's like you fit that ick is just like present throughout the whole thing um which is why because Lily's been pushing me to watch this for ages uh, I then went and watched Doctor Sleep uh, a couple of days later I have, that's um, by Mike Flanagan I haven't seen that yes. yet but I love this work um, love um and it is it is the most Mike Flanagan <laughs> <laughs> but like it's also like it really impressively done uh in that it feels um because i like you know i like reading about like how things are made and all this sorts of stuff so i read i did a lot of reading after i watched the shining and obviously just because it's such a famous film you hear stories constantly about mm. like the, the making of and how like kubrick changed a lot of the ending and how you know king did not like a lot of what he did it. with that ending and it is very odd watching the shining and knowing that it's meant to be a ghost story and like kind of going well you've got all the elements of the ghost story in here why don't you just commit because it just feels odd it feels like you're teasing a ghost story and then not really doing anything with it yeah that's weird just an odd feeling but like the way that mike flanagan does it, it it's like a really clever amalgamation of like everything that kubrick did with the movie and also the parts of the books <laughs> that, uh, that um you know stephen king like wanted within them and all this sort of stuff um, I won't spoil it because you should absolutely watch it and you should watch the director's cut because it's longer, but it is very, very good. Um, Ooh, okay. okay. Um, Thank you for the tip. Yeah, I uh, I found it. I found a download of it somewhere and it was like, oh, I thought this movie was two and a half hours. Apparently it's three and it turns out director's cut. Um, definitely worth it still. But like if it, um, it's yeah, it's very Mike Flanagan in that way that there's lots of people doing monologues and rooms and acting very well, and there's lots of themes of addiction and and you know <laughs> getting sober and all the, these things that you kind of can pick out in a lot of Mike Flanagan work. But like you know, well done because he's an incredible yeah. writer and director. Sounds like it's it's Midnight Mass, a la The Shining. Yeah, kind of. I, I, I love Midnight Mass, by yes. the way. It's one of my favorite shows I've ever seen. But there's Did that you- monologue where it's like that you know 15 minute monologue by yeah. um uh oh gosh what's what's the oh what's her name uh is Kate it, Siegel's is it... character Kate, Kate Siegel, thank you so much she's brilliant uh, I was gonna <laughs> yeah. say I remember her character Aaron Aaron yes. Green I don't know why I remember her character and then Riley but I can't remember the actors names but they have that those scenes about uh the monologues about death yeah it's just beautiful those. it's like I can't even imagine as an actor learning pages and pages and pages mm-hmm. you know a couple of days before to prepare for that that's a lot yeah, the um, Midnight Mass was um, stunning. Um, I don't know, but I grew up Catholic, so there was like a, another level of like, um, kind of like, oh yes, this feels vaguely familiar <laughs> to me. <But laughs> like, just like thematic there. I thought the way that, you know, um, that he kind of married those two things together was actually quite genius because um, mm-hmm. I had no idea the sort of like turn it was going to take um, uh, uh, part of the way through. And I was like, oh, that's so good. <laughs> Like... it's it's brilliant yeah i've i have a, a a friend who's watching it right now and she was telling me that uh she finds it in a lot of ways because she's catholic very respectful mm. of Catholicism, which is interesting because I, I think what he did was you know i don't know if she's finished the entire show so hopefully i don't know if it's going to stay that way but um it does seem like he's marrying like what you were saying like you know catholicism and like what what it is with the supernatural and it's mm. it's such an interesting take there's no judgment there yeah, I, I don't think it, you can really tell that he like grew up in it in the same way that I think yeah. many of us did. Um, uh, or it feels like I don't have like 
a judgment about this thing but I can also be critical of it like in front of the outsiders like I am aware of like the downfalls of this thing but also um I want to highlight the ways in which it was like helpful for me it's it's, it's like I I've always appreciated the way that um Daredevil did Matt Murdoch's Catholicism in the same way because it was like even if it's like not exactly like the same lived experience it still felt close enough that I was like this the vibe is very similar to how I used to feel like it's like I'm I'm not we we haven't been you know involved in in the church in a very long time but um it it, it is familiar to like some of the comfort I remember getting out of it when I was younger so it, it's a sense of like I do appreciate this but I'm also fairly aware of like anything that takes like a real deep shot at like the Catholic Church is like very warranted it's like, <laughs> extreme like I'm not going to um uh deny that it, it deserves the shots that it gets in, in in certain other things but there's also a sense of like appreciation when it, it they take you know um something that still brings comfort to people even if there is something to be um criticized about it mm-hmm. you know that sort of a thing but yeah midnight grass was great and if you're new here we have a whole episode on mike flanagan that you can go watch on our channel <laughs> 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 it's a couple of years old now but yeah um still relevant, uh, still, still always relevant always relevant um what else is i watching yeah i saw the shining and then um what did i see after the shining i, I did like i did a, like a sort of three um i think the next one i saw was the truman show which is why this is behind me um hey. again speaking of me- sort of meta pieces yeah. um uh i and i because i had yeah i hadn't seen the truman show before um and oh, it, like oh, wow. so like it's this is why my cinema doing these things is so great because it like i'm so bad at being like you know i've never watched this like really famous movie that everybody talks about i will just sit down and watch it but if my cinema has got it on i'll be like there's like i have more intention to go and i will sure. sit down and i'll be able to like appreciate it way more um so it's being able to go and like sit and watch all of these movies is like oh i'm finally getting around to watching so many things that That's i just great. have never gotten to before and like yeah i just i i it it, it's something about seeing a movie with a concept that's like so um ubiquitous at this point like it's Mm -hmm. it's one of those things that people like especially as this came up before like the reality show boom of the early 2000s which is kind of insane um uh it's like it, it is just very satisfying to watch a concept taken and executed like exactly as you would want it to be yeah oh absolutely yeah it's um it's interesting because i don't want i don't want to take away if you're going to say something no else. no go ahead i think a lot about the truman show especially in relation to social media yeah um and i think you know there's a i don't know if, if there's any Bo burnham fans on this podcast are listening to it hey <laughs> um but in in Absolutely. the end at the end of his special make happy mm. he talks about he has this great kind of mini monologue which was in a lot of ways very prescient or a prelude to inside mm. um latest netflix special as of 2021 mm. um where he's talking about how you know social media was the answer uh to people wanting to kind of perform and feel special and feel important because that's yeah. what we were raised to believe in um, and so then we were handed this thing, I think Bob Burnham says, you know, so here you go. So here's social media perform all the time for no one forever. Yeah. And it's, it's, you're, you're watching yourself, you know, perform a version of your life. And I think that's even more, you know, it's interesting how media transforms and changes and how yeah. we have different associations. I feel like this will probably be in some ways look back on the Truman show as, you know, in a lot of ways, the change with how we interact with the world and social media and ourselves and our ideas with ourselves too yeah um, just fascinating it's one of those things where i'm like that's such an interesting concept within that space mm. that it would make for an interesting like updated version of this but at the same time i don't want i want them to stop touching like good well, movies and, and then and then the, the thing is is like if they make an updated one then it would be meta upon meta it's, and then it's like you get that kind of i, I think with something like this that's so articulated and uh pointed mm. right sharp and so blunt in, in a weird way as well it's sharp and blunt it's very honest about what it is but it's also very pointed yes um if they were to update that now it would lose that and it'd be that kind of like imitation of an imitation a performance yeah of a performance, right? it, it's that feel. feeling of like because there's something incredibly earnest about this movie and we're in a space um in like 
the creation of media at the moment where everything is kind of self-referential and a bit irreverent and a bit like like oh look at what we're doing isn't this it's sort of like doesn't it there's no there's a lack of sincerity being like produced um uh and i would worry if they were to do something along those lines that there would be an inherent sort of like tongue-in-cheek wink wink nudge nudge we all know what's going on here kind of a thing which yeah. you wouldn't want with it um <laughs> yeah I, I would fear nothing against this this show but i would i would fear it would be similar to the ending of she hulk it'd be kind of that thing mm. where it's like we're aware of what we're doing and like yeah. this is written by, and it's like oh it's it's it loses that that thing of the existential dread i feel like yeah. at that point you know um it's it's like if i mean i know they kind of did a soft reboot with the matrix with um what was it was it oh no oh was it, no was it revel um re no revolutions, revolutions? <laughs> revolutions is, is that the is that third the third one, one? um oh, resurrections no! i got it resurrections, I got it. resurrections. okay i was They're like both... it's a rough sound <laughs> <laughs> that's where i was going to um they could have called it matrix rebooted i feel like that would have been you know more more anyways I, I didn't write the the the, the movie uh <laughs> no one's calling me in hollywood but i feel like if they were to try and remake directly the the first film it would lose that sincerity and that earnestness and what the, the messaging behind it that was very honest and needed and um of its time but still very uh prescient to what's going on right now yeah um i feel like like you were saying it would kind of be tongue-in-cheek if they were re to remake the truman show and it'd be a weird you know 2023 version 2024 it's like oh yeah. do we need that like what does that really say that's different i also feel like there's something about the fact that they didn't have social media that makes it such like a time capsule piece yeah. because it really couldn't have been what it is if it had come out like any later or been made any later because there would have been such a because it you know it, in the space between this movie that movie coming out and like i don't know 10 years later there was just such a shift in um technology and like the rise of the internet and all of these like massive things that have like really like warped the way that especially you know if we bring it back to Burnham in 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 the way all the ways that he he said um it's just like yeah i know there's something i also am like it, it would it would have to be such a, just like in the minutia of it would have to be such a bigger like production to keep him like right in that space um i did yeah. come out of it watching because i was watching it and i i really enjoyed it and i love like um i do think it's one of jim carrey's best performances um mm. he's so good in it um uh because he does a little bit of that sort of jim carrey you know shtick i guess you could call it but like he's very there, there is a very much a sort of sincerity to him mm -hmm. um in especially that that ending scene um where he, he's like you're you know you were never inside my head and all that sort of stuff i'm like that's just that's so good <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. so it's, um i think it's one of his best ones absolutely in terms of of uh acting performances um i'm trying to think of other films that i've seen recently with him in it hmm. he, he's kind of been i mean sonic i guess yes that's true. <laughs> but far, far cry away from from the truman show in terms of themes and just i'm trying to think of other things that he's been in he's kind I, of been i watched more... um a few like a month or so before this i watched eternal sunshine and spot's mind um, yeah. which is another movie I hadn't seen I don't know something in the air at my cinema was like Jim Carrey movies um <laughs> why not specifically Jim Carrey broke dramatic performances which was yeah. another movie I really enjoyed I hadn't actually I haven't gotten around to watching any other Charlie Kaufman stuff but I like surreal um like slightly dream like pieces of media I love when things kind of break the boundaries of like you know um reality in a way that that is um very fun for me i've, I've always just like it's i'm a, such a sucker for a dream sequence in anything <laughs> <laughs> if it's like this character dreaming so we're gonna get some visual mesh for what's going on with them i'm like hell yes sign me up <laughs> bring, bring it on um so like i really i really enjoyed that it's just how like again it, it's, it's just another thing about it being there's something about meta narratives that i'm like that's really interesting tell me more and i think yeah. it's just something i'm I'm just fascinated with the the um the building blocks of how to make a good story and what makes a good story like work and like wh wh why does this thing you know set off whatever endorphins in my brain while there's like mm. uh, this other thing might not sort of a thing so um, can i ask you a question about it yeah I, I don't did you guys ever talk about inside 
a review inside back in the day. I'm not like review. I don't remember if we actually like talked about it properly, but I would love to because like I, I I absolutely you? adore <laughs> it as a as a piece of like it's. I mean, he's <laughs> fucking ge- genius. I had a real Bo Burnham thing um <laughs> at the beginning of 2018. I want to say I got really into his stuff because I watched Make Happy um and like got fully obsessed with it um this was around the time he suddenly announced that he was like never going to do stand up again sort of thing and i was like oh well i've missed the boat now haven't i (laughs) but um i listened to um his live albums just so much that yeah i think he was my top artist (laughs) like like so many of those things but like yeah um big i love i love bo burnham i love i think he's so so good <laughs> me too me too I, I i just talked about meta you know with inside i think yeah it was something that came up with staged as well and i think that was an interesting thing about covid mm. pieces of media was that they were all very focused on meta narratives because you you were you know an actor and and just the directors and writers they were very limited to what they could do and they couldn't yeah. do high concept things but the highest concept they could do was is this real or is it not and that would seem to be a theme and both staged and inside which was much more emotionally charged and much more i think prodding yes. towards you know people um i'll have to do with the question of like what was real and what was for the story and is there a, a combination or a version of it where it's actually both mm. and that the story can have extremely emotionally real elements while also telling a story and then vice versa and i think that's yeah. really fascinating too of you know i think the the transformation and um evolution of meta narratives had it seems to have gone away from like oh truman show or like matrix you know like kind of like reality mm. stuff it's different we're living in, in an alternate reality or a different reality than we think to people can be different than they seem and the yeah. stories that we see are different than we than we uh believe them to be i think that's an interesting change that's happened over the last i don't know 10 years i would say yeah it's an interesting point i think of when i think of like a meta narrative and like the like the idea of narrative is like character specifically yeah. i get very fixated on the idea that like of of um fate basically because kind mm. of when you think of a narrative it has an ending in mind right generally speaking um uh <laughs> sometimes they don't have an ending in mind and you can <laughs> tell but <laughs> for something like a movie as i guess specifically um that a movie that is created to be its own thing no sequels intended sort of that kind of a vibe you know that there is um the person creating it pardon me um has um decided on where these characters are going to end up and like the idea of like the characters within that story being aware and not being able to like change their Mm -hmm. their ending because of it being like a a form of fate so those kind of discussions of like destiny and all that sort of stuff i don't know if you did you play um god of war ragnarok i no i I played the first one but i haven't played ragnarok yet ragnarok is very interesting in that fact because it, it, it a lot of it plays on this idea of like what is does it mean to like have a fate and a destiny and can those things change um mm. and it, it did that in a very interesting way um and and like a very emotional way in a way that that ended up being very cathartic because i think the other thing with the, that kind of a narrative or like an understanding of like that that narrative kind of exists in that way is that um the whole point of a narrative is you're bringing your audience on a journey and I think that's actually something that gets a bit lost in some of the storytelling that we get nowadays is that like you want your audience to feel certain things that you want them to be moved and like and it but it also means that characters are not just like they're not and then this is something that uh, my my teachers in school used to get on me a lot because I used to write about characters in like books and stuff when I was doing you know essays and whatnot like they were real people characters are not actually real people they are devices for the story to you know work essentially um and if um and if you don't understand if you or if you there's a lack of understanding that your character needs to go through conflict or something along those lines um in order to make something compelling to watch um then you don't actually get that good of a story <laughs> mm, mm. um it, it's it's i don't know there's a whole weird thing and i think there's actually a um lack of understanding from like an audience perspective as well as a, like sometimes your characters are going to do stuff and are going to go through things that you don't like but you do need to like allow yourself to experience the entire thing because Lily and I talk about this a lot where it's like you need to watch the whole thing before you can actually judge the thing that you're you're watching 
because otherwise yeah. you're judging prematurely. She said, I think one of the many reasons she got frustrated with me when I was like talking about, ah we were talked about Ahsoka a little while ago and I was like, it, it feels like nothing happened. And she goes, it's set up. And I'm like, I know. <laughs> I, yeah, the, it's it's that arc question, right? Where it's like, oh, I don't like this character. It's like, yeah, but like they need to start one place to end up to another. And there's a contrast. And that's, it's not only uh, narratively satisfying and interesting. It's also how people work. <clears throat> Pardon me. We don't always stay in one place. We always, you know, we we change and we transform. Um, so I think it has to mimic that. But I think there is that, there is that interesting question of, you know, an unlikable character there's there's all that there's typically a lot of backlash oh no my voice is just i'm i think i have a frog or <clears throat> or some sort of bug that crawled into my throat um i think it's gone now okay we're good, <laughs> we're all um, good. <laughs> we'll see if it tries to crawl back up um <laughs> there's that question because i've seen that but it's like oh this character is unlikable it's like but maybe that's the point <laughs> mm -hmm. maybe that's the purpose and maybe that's that's important for the setup of the narrative and the story for it to be effectively told Yes. So I completely agree with you. It's back now. <laughs> <clears throat> oh man. Okay. Do you need some water or something? Are you good? Oh, I no. I I'm trapped in this room. This is where oh. I, I'm stuck. I actually okay. just exist within this Zoom box. Oh, so it's like we're leave. fully living inside. Then. <laughs> like, right. Exactly. <laughs> it is inside. Yeah. So yeah. I, I can't leave. If you um, okay. I'll I'll yeah no. I'll just no. I'll suffer. <laughs> okay. <laughs> gotcha. Um. But yeah. I don't know. I've got I've got a real thing about like um. I it, it it's one of those things I've spent so much time dissecting and like trying to understand you know narrative as like a thing that there's like I it, I mean I guess there's a, there's times where I miss the days where you could like just watch something and just be like yeah it was good yeah, but at the yeah. same time <laughs> that's so boring to me <laughs> like I can't like not be like but okay but why how does it work why do, why, mm. why does this work in such a in, in such a you know um, wh why does this satisfy? I think is always the question that kind of comes up. Or why doesn't this satisfy? Because I think that's even even more important question. Watching yeah. things and being like, this didn't work for me. Why didn't it work? Um, uh, it's part of right um, that whole sort of sense of like a narrative. Um, uh, what's the? I just had the word and it's gone again. Satisfaction. Um, mm -hmm is is what i got i don't know if you, if you felt the same because we just did our episode on on, on loki and and the marvels but i don't know if you got i, I was just about to ask you about it um because um yeah i i personally loved loki's ending because i thought it was like, very beautifully tragic and sort of the culmination of 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 everything um and it wasn't tragic in a way that was like this shouldn't have happened but tragic in a way like this was always should have like this this had to be the way it ended sort of a feeling yeah, I I felt similarly. I so I was a person who, going into like the Marvel films, I've I've always really appreciated Tom Hiddleston's acting. He was great in Crimson Peak, and he's just a tremendous actor. And seems like a lovely person too, from what I've heard. Um, I've never been a big fan of the Loki character. I never just was one of those people. Like, oh, wow, yeah, I just for whatever reason. Um, and so I I put off watching the Loki show because I'm like, oh, it's just gonna be more of the same. And then I, I sat down to watch the first season. I finished it all in one night. I was enthralled because of, I think, you know, talking about, for me personally, talking about a character who I didn't really prefer, mm. who's just kind of smarmy and very smug. <laughs> I know, the things that people like about him, I get it. Yeah. But then he became this person who had a lot of heart and and insight and um, empathy. Was And it still felt like the same person. It didn't feel like a different character suddenly. It was really mm. cool to slowly see that shift to. And then I was, in, I was enthralled with it. Um, and then season two, I felt like you were saying, like, the culmination of him, we can spoil this, I assume. Yes, because right? we've talked about it before, but just in post, case, yeah. Loki, um, you can watch all the Loki season two on Disney Plus, and then you can come back and watch this bit. And then also watch our episode where we reviewed the whole thing. <laughs> before, <laughs> that's all homework before this. Yes, so but pauses. also you could just continue on if you want. <laughs> <laughs> you could do that too. Just pretend you didn't hear it. Um, to see him care so deeply about the people around him. And then, you know, it wasn't for me, I, I always get really perturbed by the whole like ultimate sacrifice, like I have to, you know, die to save my friends. And it's like a cliche, which wasn't the case. There was something more, like you said, tragic, but beautiful of him, you know, saying, I can't remember the line, but like, you know, he, he realizes the God he wants to be and he creates the world tree and he's holding it together. And it's that, that very like Frodo, um, Voyage of the Hero smile at the end where he's just smiling for the friends that get to live their lives and he's still seeing it. And there's some, I, I cried a little, like it kind of moves me now 
to see someone who's just so selfish and narcissistic go to that place where he's just holding the world together for his family. Um, it was, I, I can't imagine anything else that they could have done with that ending, you know? Yeah. I think it really, because like, I think it, it, it really does solidify this sense of like, this was a selfish character who wanted, you know, glory for the sake of glory because he felt like that was what was owed to him. Ending up in a place where he was taking on something that was a glorious purpose, mm. but he is actively burdened with it. And mm. it's like, he doesn't get to have the the thing that he wants, which is just to like live day to day with like, the people that he cares about, but he does get to make sure that they get to live um, yeah. in a way uh, um, that, you know, means that he gets to uh, that, that little ghost of a smile at the end of it. And I think I saw a lot of people being like, there is a sense of, of tragedy about Mobius not having his like, you know, friend, potential lover, I don't know who. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, I'll bring it up every once in a while. I just think that ship is uh, adorable, and I think it's lovely. Um, I haven't even heard about that one. Oh, there's big, one. big on Tumblr. People really big into those two. You have to remember, I watch basically the whole series in like the span of like five or six days, so I'm I'm new to all like what's going on. Okay, understandable. But like, there is something like you know, it, it's just it's just that thing of people see a connection between characters, and they're like. Uh, you know, this means something to me, so they turn it into yeah. like <laughs> these two people should be together in a romantic setting. I I, yeah. I appreciate it in all forms and all that sort of stuff. That made appreciate me sound it. like I'm better than you. That's not what I meant. I'm just. <laughs> um, I understand. Uh, you can you can see from different perspectives. Yeah, yeah. it's like I, I I get it. It's like, but it's I don't know. There was a lot of people kind of like very sad. Um, uh, thought that Loki was being like. I don't know, looking on sadly at his friends, or there was something like, I don't know. There is something really interesting about that final scene is what I'm trying to say. Because, like, I think people interpret Mobius talking about standing and letting time pass mm -hmm. as something, like, bad. And I think you can see it as something that's, like, sad and, like, slightly tragic and all this sort of stuff. But I think at the same time, there is something so... It, it is actually a good thing. And I think that yeah. is quite if it, that I think people have been struggling to like maybe quantify as much is that the idea that the reason he did that sacrifice is so that Mobius could get the choice to do, you know, he could stay at the TVA if he wants to do, or he could go and like actually let time pass for himself for yeah. the first time ever. Um, and I just think that's like I don't know to be able to if you can take something that's like that big and like has that much history and kind of turn like I, I always talk about it like taking it and like turning it around in my head and like taking it apart and putting it together in different ways and seeing if like does that still fit with this thing like thematically and all that sort of stuff and when it does do that it's like <laughs> success <laughs> this is fascinating <laughs> I'm going to keep pulling this apart until I can't put it into some weird shape anymore and it makes something doesn't fit i guess <laughs> don't decagon at that point yeah and it's I, like no, i don't know it's like some weird thing where you, you take apart the ends and you put them together in a different way and it's like oh it's a different shape but it still works it, it, that's something that i was really i think amazed with and impressed by was that you know it was obviously within the mcu but it wasn't at the same time it felt mm. so so separate from what was going on with the mcu timeline that i i obviously that was part of the intention but mm and the, the basis of the show but i was i was always concerned that once they asked axed the um the netflix disney or netflix disney the netflix mcu shows because they're i guess they're on disney plus but they don't count anymore they're retcon they're the netflix ones we can do it. <laughs> yeah cheers um i was scared like they wouldn't go into like the weird anymore they wouldn't yeah. go into like you know separate kind of high concept weird and and have their own separate stories and what's impressive to me personally that i found was they took one of the, the biggest characters, most loved characters by most people, Loki, and they create a completely separate story that still obviously intertwines. We'll see what they do with Kang and mm. all that stuff um, because of stuff. Yeah. But <laughs> uh, yeah, but uh, they they created a really contained focused narrative Yeah. Um, that was just really interpersonal and character driven. I think mm. that's pretty amazing in, in 2023 with how big the MCU is and how big Tom Hiddleston yeah. is as an actor yeah i think it, it kind of speaks to a lot of um 
So we had a really big discussion about, I don't know if you saw Variety released an article recently. We we talked about this in the last episode as well, where they were talking about how like they were like, the MCU is in shambles and like all of the things that are going on with them I- internally and like how they kind of need to restructure and all this sort of stuff. And yeah. we kind of agreed that like, they're not really in shambles. They have reached a point where they obviously need to make a different like choice and they are starting to make different choices um in like business wise in order for them to like get back to a place where they can be like on top of things again but it's like not they're not if they keep going in the same direction it's not going to work out for them and i think they're very aware of this um but for me i don't know there's something about loki i think um something i said in the episode is like i think it's because he i think it's because of that sense of like history and the fact that Tom Hiddleston's been so connected to that character for such a long time, not just in playing him, but like he's a, he's credited as executive producer on on the series. Um, that bit, there's a bit in the finale where he turns to them, uh, uh, you know, as he looks at them, he's about to go and you know take all the timelines and hold them together, where he alludes to a line he says in Thor, like the original Thor. Um, oh, where the, uh, like, for, for you, all for all of us, I think is what yeah, it was something like that. Um, and apparently, Tom Hiddleston came up with that over lunch, and he was like, "I've That's got so a cool. thing. I want to do a thing." And he told them that and he was like, "I think we should do this," and they were like, "Yeah, we should do that." <laughs> <I was> like <laughs> crying quietly. <laughs> like, this is very moving. Um, so it's like to have a character that like feels very full and and mm. and like has like these temples of like who they are as a person, how they end like. Um, a real understanding of like those things. Um, I wish is I don't know something I feel like the MCU is like lacking in a couple of places because they've got so many new characters. We don't have that kind of time sink yet, which is yeah. you know just an you know an inherent part of the process. Uh, I'm sure we'll get to that point eventually with with many of the like new people. Um, it's just hard to be there at this point, I think. But it's like yeah, I don't know. I'm rambling. <laughs> No, no, not at all. No, I, I completely agree. And, and I, I was reading an article, you know, where Tom Hiddleston was talking about how he's been playing the part since he was 29. He's 42 now. I just That's a whole bunch of your life, like, lived in the same character. And obviously, you know, he did side projects and other films, but to still be within the same character and cast in that and utilize as much as he has been for that long, I think that's that's something you can't, <clears throat> you can't replace that. You know, you can you can't fake that either. You have to you have to kind of have that time with that character and sink into it to have the same level of weight and which is what we're missing from like the new MCU because they're so they're so new. I, I think a lot of those new characters, those new actors to those parts, understandably so. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's something to be said also about um, the importance of of letting the actor playing, especially if they're like a franchise character. Like have, letting them have a say in who they think that that character is, yeah. because like you're going to have so many writers and directors that are going to change, like the the character is going to like change between hands so much, and everybody's going to have a different take. To be able to have somebody in the middle of it and be like, I don't think that this person would do this, no matter what like the circumstances of the story are, um, like and be able to like put the foot down and go, no, I don't think that's right, or go, actually, I think that that's like that's the most correct thing to do in this in this circumstance is like really invaluable and like mm-hmm. it speaks to just how like important those people are to the process of like, creating these stories and i do wonder sometimes i mean it's complete speculation because I, I honestly don't know but i do wonder if like maybe there's a, a push away from that in the sort of mcu machine like they're not like i'm not saying that they're like being making them maniacal about it but like <laughs> um uh, because of like the push of content that we've had they've not been as much space for the actors playing the characters to be able to be like actually i think this is who this person is and like be able to put like their foot down a bit more about it yeah it's, it's, <laughs> it, from what i've i mean it, i think it depends on the film too but like from what i've read so i'm, I'm prefacing it because i don't mm. know everything um <laughs> it seems like a lot of the newer mc movies aside from like no way home um yeah it, it was a lot of like assembly line made by committee type of stuff yeah not for every single one, but some of them. And I think then you lose that that character and that soul and like that the heart in it. And um you lose that, like you said, like that that invaluable nature of like the actor still playing the same part, being able to say, mm-hmm. Hey, this is what I think would happen, not from an ego place, but from a consistency level place. So being like, yeah. I know this happened, this is inconsistent with this. Um, I think you you don't have that time. Mm-hmm. It's just like pushed out and rushed because you know, it is a business ultimately, yeah. industry. 
uh, for better or for worse. So, uh, yeah, it's, I know, I hope we get more things like Loki. Mm, I really, me too. Uh, I, I feel Um, very dubious about what they're going to be doing with the Daredevil reboot and the remake. yeah, I'm, I'm, I kind of, I jump back and forth. I'm really excited because I'm, I love, I think, I just think that Charlie Cox really is absolutely that character. You know, sometimes you just find a person that's like, yeah, that's, that's going to be that guy for, for like as much as we can like keep him for that now. But the moment they were like, yeah, Foggy and Karen are going to be in this, I was I like, know. are you sure? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. you still Are, are time you, is, to this, change your mind. <laughs> is this the right decision? Or are you positive? Foggy in particular, because he's such a, like a he's such a core part of that original um Netflix series. And my, one of my favorite parts, <laughs> to be honest with you. Um uh but yeah, I don't know, it's it's such a, a, a thing. Um I was gonna ask you, well, um, we've only got a little bit of time with you left, Mm. Oh but yeah. I am curious because you are an actor. Um uh, <laughs> I'm um um fascinated on your perspective on like the importance of like um like an actor having say over like character within like the creation of something and like how much do you feel like that should be like a constant thing or um I don't really know what the question I'm asking really I'm just like uh, curious about your perspective on like that as like because I'm I was thinking about um it's busy because I was watching the X-Files again recently um uh I I just for fun I don't know I had just had like a real itch for it recently and I was thinking about how there's like there's so many Chris Carter never had like a show bible for that show like the, so you, the mythology is all over the fucking place <laughs> like, there's just like stuff that happens and you're like what does that mean why didn't you write any of this down sort of thing but like <laughs> Jillian and David became such like custodians for those characters that mm. they kind of um yes Chris was like there as well kind of it had a had a very clear voice on on these sorts of things but I feel like so much of the parts that like the audience ended up responding to came from the actors who played them do you feel like yeah. that is like I don't know do you feel like it should be the way of things like they like the actors who play these characters should should be able to like put that input in or I, do you feel like there needs to be a kind of a separation of state in the I creation of something on, yeah I, I think it depends on the project <laughs> yeah I think it depends on the context of of the project and what the nature of the project is calling for and and you know if there is a strong director or, or writer that's leading the project a showrunner and if that's the case then I, even then, I think like there's always collaboration because I think that's important. I think if mm. I, I've never worked on a Marvel show, obviously, mm -hmm. but uh, I, you know, I think, I think if you don't have that 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 give and take and that that conversation, that dynamic conversation of oh, like what about this? Let's try this and that play, mm. then you're just being delegated to places and you're just being you're kind of like right. a puppet, yeah. and. I you're think, George. You, you're you're an actor in a George Lucas movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what, what was the last thing you said? Sorry. A, an actor in a George Lucas movie. <laughs> exactly, exactly, and you get those performances because uh, because of that, right? Because he says, you know, say that harder, or more intensely, or slower. Yeah. There's no, you're, you're they're just animatronics, basically. Yeah. I feel so bad for those those because they're really good <laughs> actors too. Like I, I'll always remember like how stilted like. Uh, Samuel Jackson's line, the oppression of the Sith will never, like, it's like a da-da, da-da. It's like, what is that? I've never heard him talk about that <laughs> ever in my life. And it's like, what is that? You know, da-da, da-da. Um, and that's definitely a George Lucas line reading. You can just yeah. hear him kind of saying, like, say it like that. Um, so I, I, I do think it, it it is inherently important to have a conversation. I, I think it's I think it's it's you know it depends on the relationship with the showrunner and the actor about like being like hey i think we should try this or this um i think with someone like tom hilson who's lived with the character that long um that makes He'd complete be insane sense. not to listen to him <laughs> exactly and and he he's, he was a mega fan before he was cast in it as well from what i've read um so my answer is <laughs> it's like not it's it's kind of gray it's like yes and And it depends. I think, I think you always need that dynamic uh, conversation. It can never be just like do this. But I think at the same time, it's like if someone has a really strong vision and you trust the showrunner or the director, then I, I there might be less need to say, oh, well, actually, this isn't consistent with this because I, I think they'd probably have a handle on it. Not to say like there won't be moments because everyone's, you know, a person and like we're all fallible. And we have moments where it's like, oh, we need to be reminded of things. But uh, it's it's really dependent upon the the 
the situation. I think a lot about like Willem Dafoe talks about how he doesn't have an acting process, like one singular technique, because every single project is different and every mm. single project has a different process because you can't use the same thing you did last time because it's completely different from yeah. this. So I think of it similarly to that, I'd imagine. I think that... of, yeah, no, I, I entirely agree. I, I think of, um, I think about Kieran Culkin when, when you say that as well, because uh, I don't know if you've, um, I don't know if you've seen any of Succession. If you haven't, you absolutely no, need to watch no, Succession. I'm, I'm not on the Succession train. Oh, <laughs> you need to get on the Succession train because man, that was it. fucking good. Um, but you know, listening to Kieran Culkin talk about his process of like creating, uh, or like real, like, because he was like, you know, a child actor and he kind of got to a point in his like, you know working career where he was like i don't want to process it makes me think too much i just need to go and do the thing like uh he's like he's an insane sort of person for being able to like be give like a page of dialogue and just like memorize it within five minutes um oh, he's like people. he's that kind of uh, a guy um which works very well for succession because like so many things like changed on the fly and they played so much in that space um and created some of the most like like insane drama but also some of the most hilarious stuff like the camera operators on that show are some of the funniest people like, like it just in the way that they somebody will say something and they'll react to it so quickly and like create a visual gag from it um oh. um because everything was so dynamic there's one there's like a joke that didn't end up in the show because it was honestly too funny for the scene that it was in um but every time i read about it it is like hysterically funny it would take too far too long to explain like context and all this sort of stuff um but like, um uh it, it is yeah it's just like the way that they created that show was bonkers because it's like they shot it on film they had like multiple cameras running during scenes like, oh, everybody whoa. had to be like oh. react like constantly in stuff in order to be like yeah, yeah. They, somebody might re catch you in a reaction or what have you because it felt like a bit like a mockumentary even though it's not like actually a mockumentary in, in the creation it's just got that stylized sort of feeling of it but it's just yeah. really fascinating to me because like the way like there's been so much press around the way that jeremy strong like was kendall and the way he like really was like very deep in that character compared to somebody like kieran who was just like i don't know i'm just gonna turn up on the day and say some fucking stuff yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and yeah. both of those things like worked really well for both of those people because of like the characters they were playing um yeah, yeah, and and it's it's I think you know it's looking at the project and seeing where you fit in it as an actor too, and seeing what it requires might be different than like another actor, a different character as well. So it's it's uh, that's that's really interesting. I'll have to get now. I have to watch you it now. Get into you, it. You've, you've got to kind of give it some time because it's like the first few episodes are interesting, but I feel like if you don't if you don't feel like you, you've been sucked in by like episode six. Like I think four is like the turning point, and then episode six. If you're not in it by episode six, you're probably not going to be in it if it, okay. for the, like the long run. Because I th that's what happened to me. I watched like the first th two or three episodes, and I was like, this is fine. And then I didn't watch it for like another like two months. And then I went back to it, and and like just was like I ate like the entire thing basically. Um, <laughs> and then I, I it was like one of my it was I watched it week to week as it was coming out that last season. Um, so it was like Sunday nights they showed Succession, so I watched it on Monday mornings. And then on Wednesdays they had Ted Lasso, so I was doing like oh. some of the most like insane drama I'd ever seen. And then <laughs> following it up a couple of days later with like just some of the nicest stuff ever. <laughs> just, just crying, just constant crying. Just like, I mean, <laughs> oh my god! So one of the episodes in, in the third episode of season four of Succession, I wept through, oh, which wow. feels like strange for that show, um, because it, it's like. The, these people are not nice people it's like when you're watching it you kind of go into it it's like yeah i don't i don't really you know it's like i i'm i'm watching like animals at the zoo kind of a feeling where it's like the, the, these people are not relatable and yet by that last season it's like oh my, get out just get out of, get out of this yeah. business get out of all of it you don't need to be here anymore <laughs> so like, i want better for you even if they you, you kind of watch them it's like no they're terrible they're terrible people they're completely out of touch with everything but it's like i also worry about you though <laughs> like, you know my, my last question are because i know we're, we're getting to the end are, are they worse characters like in terms of like kindness than like the fall of the house of usher because like they're <laughs> it's very similar Okay. But like okay. over the, it, it's like it, it very actually very very similar vibes in that sort of like these are very rich kids who grew up like not wanting for anything and just like yeah. don't understand regular people. Um, yeah. But like yeah. you kind of get the it, it, the thing about it is you spend so much time with them you get a sense of like 
oh, there was no way there were going to ever be anything different. Like they were mm-hmm. trapped in this from the beginning as well. Like you, you get to see like it, it's that thing again of like there was like no way for you to get out of this because like nobody had the there was no outside influence that had was strong enough to bring you out of the space so you could actually (laughs) get out of this bubble that exists that you're in and that you're trapped in really because like the whole thing is like this this extended um a metaphor for like becoming king because it's like they're, they're becoming like the leader of an empire essentially but it's all framed around business so it's like who's going to it who is going to take over logan roy when he you know decides to step down or passes away that kind of a thing so there's like all of these metaphors constantly throughout it about like i'm going to be king the crown is mine that 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 kind of like thing but it, it in the same way it has that sense of like of like you know the 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 kids are all constantly battling each other for like you know dad's approval and like the, the, the trouble is that like what they need is familial love and they're yeah. not getting it from anywhere you know so and the places strange. they do end up getting it from they end up like destroying because they don't know how to love properly like it's like that they're the whole taught. they've never been taught properly so it's like yeah there's of course they're not going to end up any different so you kind of just end up feeling bad for them by the end of it <laughs> interesting i'd like to see that because i think that was a, a, a difficult thing for me with fall house of usher i'm obviously that's the story but they were just so some of the characters were just so unkind and so yes. it was like I I I I feel bad for the people I and mean, we can spoil it obviously I feel mm. bad for like you know a lot of the other people who died in like the acid rain incident yes. I don't really, fuck me that was insane that was that was traumatizing but I I one of the most disturbing things I think I've seen in modern TV in a long time which was brilliant but also just very it, haunting mm. but it's like I, you know a lot of these characters are horrible and just yeah. treat people dirt it's like who cares yeah it's kind of hard i think it's very difficult to 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 walk that line of being like how do we make these people relatable but like not that you want to be them you know and that sort of like i understand you i also think you're wrong that kind of like being able to like really tread that line as like a, 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 a storyteller and trying to get that into an audience is hard um oh. and i think actually you know it's hard it, mike flanagan does that very well i think in that series because like inherently the idea is you know these are terrible people but it also mm. brings out the tragedy of like lenore way more when you get to that point it's like no but like, she was good and it's like doesn't yeah. matter <laughs> yeah they just they, it, it's it doesn't like, matter um, that's the deal dominoes that fall like you're just in the way and yeah yeah yeah. Yeah. Succession does that sort of that line very well because like you'd, you'd sit there and you'd be like, I'm very attached to this one character at the moment. Um, uh, they've gone through some stuff. I'm feeling very like compassionate towards them. And then within like a couple of episodes, they'll do something real horrible, and you're like, mm. God damn it! Thanks for reminding me who these people are because I would I might have started making excuses for them. <laughs> 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 and it's then like, going uh, going like... back to the other place of being like, Yeah, but you should also feel for them. It's like, Oh no. <laughs> got so much feeling for these that's cool to keep the audience in like a conflict like being pulled in two different places that's interesting yeah absolutely yeah Yeah. um well i I know you gotta you gotta get off to a meeting very soon i do want to bring up one final thing before we go um and that is that you did a production of one of my favorite pieces of theater uh which is seawall yeah and i just wanted to ask you a little bit about that because i watched I watched the Andrew, I watched Andrew Scott perform that back in 2012 or something like that because there's like a like a like a movie that you can buy on the website and whatnot and it spellbound me like I mean because I mean he's this like you know it's him and a camera and he's just doing this monologue and I was just wondering what that like because you I, I don't know did you just you decide to do that but was that was that something you picked or was that something that like I don't know um you know was recommended to you or something I'm not sure no no I I. I picked it. Uh, I I fell in love with Seawall uh, back when it came out around 2011, 2012. Mm. And it was when I was in high school, still deciding what I wanted to do in terms of going forward with my life. But I remember watching it and just being completely moved and and shattered and and nothing Mm. had really touched me that deep. I had never seen something acted so well and so believably until that that moment. I mean, Andrew Scott's just an uh, incredible actor and so honest and so... um, and so real mm. in terms of just conversational and and not 
not putting anything on. He's just he's just telling the story in such a, a gorgeous way. And so um, what happened was that 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 show, that play, that story um, has stayed with me all my life since I saw that. So I auditioned with uh, a piece of it uh, for drama school, the uh, Bristol Big Theater School. Um, and I've worked on pieces of that that whole monologue many, many times throughout my life. But it was during COVID when I didn't know what else to do. And I was I was ill mm. um, at the time with the condition that I have. And there was nothing going on in terms of theater or anything that was like, well, why don't I put this on? Because I can't imagine I'll ever be cast as this. You know, it was written for Andrew Scott and it was written for uh, someone who's, uh, you know, not American typically. <laughs> Um, but I decided to learn, you know, an Irish accent in this case and, uh, cast myself in it. My, my, uh, good friend and fellow actor, um, or former actor, I, I'm not sure what he does now, but, uh, he does breath work mainly, but I'm not mm -hmm. sure if he still acts, um, uh, directed it, uh, for me. And then we ended up doing a couple shows in Portland and did it on the East coast, uh, and then did it in the UK in Bristol. Um, so yeah, it was it was a labor of love because for for my director he was in love with the the story too, and it meant a lot to both of us about grief and loss mm -hmm. and the nature of how people <clears throat> may seem okay on the surface, but underneath there might be a seawall, and yeah. you never really know what's going on until you listen to a story, until you listen to what they have to say. And even then, grief may not be what you think it should look like or imagine, imagine it should look like. Um, and those were things I was processing and dealing with, too. So it felt just like a, a perfect segue into telling that story and trying to understand it for myself and heal myself at that time as well. But, I mean, Simon Stevens, who's the, the writer, yeah. um, is just absolutely genius and has some of the greatest empathy for a character that I've ever seen. Um, mm -hmm. I think Alex, the character in, in Seawall, the, the main uh, character, um, is just such a, a fully fleshed out human being. And he doesn't, you know, he's not just a wholesome, like, oh, like everything's like great inside. Mm -hmm. He has stuff. He has human issues. He's, he's complex. He goes to different places, which is how we are. And I think that was an interesting thing to show grief through that, that mirror of just great empathy mm -hmm. and humanity. One of so. my favorite things watching that is the way that he'll he'll start down like a route and he's talking about something and then it's mm. clearly like, oh, well, this thing's a bit too much for me at this moment. So he yeah. like completely pivots into an entirely different direction. He'll start yeah. talking about something else entirely, and it's just the way that that still manages to come together so full circle by the end of it. Um, yeah, it's just I I was I remember watching it. I literally sat I'd like I used to have a little iMac like set up in my room, and I like. Um, I begged my dad to buy it for me because I was like 14, 15 and I didn't have money at that point. <laughs> and I was like, please, it's only five pounds. I really want this. And I just like sat and like just enraptured with it for the, in, the entire thing. And so I, I just remember when I saw you were doing it, I was like, just, just like taste. Like, what a good choice <laughs> of like oh. a, a thing to do. Um, I wish I could have seen it. I didn't know you were over here. I would have come, <laughs> honestly. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, I, it was, it was, like a two week quick, like pulled together thing. Um, it was right before I, I, I came back. So I was in a mini program there for about two months in the UK, two or three months. And I was like, I really want to do Seawall. And I, I did it this really small, really great theater though, called the Alma Theater in Bristol, Alma Theater in Tavern. Um, but they were the only people who responded to me in about a month. And so then I had like two weeks to get it all together and I just hired a lighting person and just had like a stool, you know, just like a chair and that was it. Um, and it. <laughs> it was, well, yeah, and you don't need it. The cool thing about the show, and like I think Simon Stevens talks about this, is like, you know, you could do it on the street. If like the theater, like the lights shut down or like the emergency like alarm went off, you could do it on the street if you needed to. And for me, I think that anything that like makes it easier for people to, to get to theater, to see acting or see a really, really needed story, yeah, and just doesn't have separation is really poignant and, and, and amazing you know yeah. like you don't need the whole spectacle to be moved um but I'm sure I'll do it again in the future it, it's something that I'll, I'll continuously go back to because I love it so much and yeah it, it was actually it wasn't until the final show in Bristol where I'm like I think I understand this now finally it's <laughs> after doing it for two years sometimes I like that I don't know it's it's, it's funny um there's still like 
um I've, I've i talk about this all the time on this in, in this podcast but one of my favorite shows of all time is called the leftovers um mm. uh i don't have you seen it i'm trying i'm trying to figure out if that was I've, it I, i've heard of it i've okay. heard of it before and i've very it, very I've similar never... in like themes and, and all this sort of stuff um and like i watch it more like i've watched it so many times that i bought kind of lily and i will do this thing every once in a while where i'll be like you have to watch this and she goes fine but only if you watch this thing which <laughs> like uh, like usually things that neither of us will like be inclined to watch like on our own but like we'll watch it for the other person just to get like their perspective on something that we really like so i watched the leftovers so i got her to watch the leftovers and i watched kingdoms which is a korean drama um which i very much enjoyed it was very very good um and she was like it was good i'm never watching it again <laughs> it was so depressing <laughs> and i'm like it's very strange for me to hear that because like i will watch it over and over again there's something really i don't know there's something about the way that they, the discussion of grief in it that is very comforting to me yeah. and i think it's the same as same thing for me in in seawall um my final question before i say we'll wrap this up is i'm just curious okay. if you have like a favorite like line or quote or part of the, the play because oh. i have a couple and i'm curious if you got... i mean i because i know all of it like yeah. all of it is so i i I mean, I think the, the, there's a hole in the center of my stomach is there's something that for me, I really resonated with at the time and just trying to believing that everyone can see it. You know, mm -hmm. it's kind of very much that picture of, of, of uh, Jim Carrey of just holding out the arms and be like, there's a hole here. Mm -hmm. um, and that's I'm that image, absolutely right? absolutely inside myself is my absolutely. favorite part Yeah, there's that part. I'm a, I'm a, yeah, the shell and the, yeah, I mean, that, that whole ending part. And, you know, just because we don't know doesn't mean we won't know. That's we just the other one that's my that. favorite. <laughs> but I think we will. I think we will. That for me gave me hope. And I think when I when I played the last time I mean it's because I, I I'm so used to the story like I, I like start tearing up because I've mm -hmm. lived with Alex which is a weird thing to to have that kind of like autotomic response yeah um, but for me when I first started getting into the rehearsals of that show I didn't realize how hopeful of a line that was mm -hmm. and how that's him really holding on to something and not giving up and before I think I always in the past shows I sometimes played it as Oh, uh, maybe we will kind of throwing it away mm. but that is i believe now that is him saying i have to believe this i'm firmly believing that i think we will mm. um i think that part and i think you know of course the metaphor of the seawall the graduate it's not a gradual yeah. slope um there's one in particular that i'm trying to think of though and i think it's what is it it's oh yeah it's it's this is the part that 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 i carried with me i had it on my notebook for a long time i carried mm. with me which was, um, um, sometimes you think the tides caught you. You panic because you think you're not moving. You are, you just need to turn on your back, collect your breathing, kick slowly, and you're moving. Uh, and I love that, I love that, because there's so much, I mean, the, the whole thing is so metaphorical, but it's also practical too, and it's just about like, you may think like you're stuck and stagnant and you're stuck in the grief and that it won't go away, but you are moving forward, whether or not you recognize it or see it yet. Mm -hmm. Um, it's such an empathetic show and so it's kind so, to people. It's so it, it, yeah, it, I can feel the tears. <laughs> yeah, I, it's, I'm sorry to like. It, it, no, no, not at it, all. It, no, it ended it, on this, but I think it's just one of those. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's I don't know. I've I've only I've only actually I think I've watched it maybe twice through, hmm. um, and I haven't watched it in a really long time. But yeah, just because we don't know doesn't mean we won't know. But I think one day we will. It's such one of those things that I, I, it's it like it lives in there, you know. It's like so firmly, um, uh, in there. I, I, it's, it's really interesting to hear you say that it, it felt like such like a, like oh, who knows, who cares sort of a thing. Because like, yeah, I've always, I've, I think I've always felt that sort of like, it's like the constant search for an answer is kind mm -hmm. of the point, and that's yep. where the the hope comes in. Um, yeah, which yeah. I really, yeah. Oh, sorry to interrupt you. No, no, no. no. I, that's just it's just I love that. <laughs> no, and I'm glad you do, and because I think that's that's that is the thesis of the show in so many ways. You know, and when because he, he says it twice, and at the end he says, you know, just because we won't know, don't don't know, just it doesn't mean we won't know. We just don't know yet. And I think mm -hmm. for me, at the time, I was missing that really crucial part of yet. Um, and it, I, I also think of acting, and, and I don't want to like wax lyrical about this, <laughs> but um, acting and like and and playing the same character. <clears throat> you you relate with where you're at at the time mm. and so i think at that time when i first started doing the show i was at that place where oh like 
kind of what's the point or, mm. you know, I don't see that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Whereas that's one of the key points of who Alex is, is that he's always looking for that and seeing that as a possibility if he doesn't recognize it yet. Um, and so I think it's interesting, like making that connection at the very last show, it's like, oh, maybe that means that I've gotten better and healed a bit from what happened from yeah. my stuff. You know, um, whereas inherently you saw that, which is beautiful. And I think I, I <laughs> admire that greatly. So, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I just wanted to, to bring it because it, it, yeah, it really is one of those things that I've, 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 I think I tried to force some friends of mine to watch it, but we were like, yeah, like I said, it was like 15 and nobody else cared. And I was like, yeah. look at this really cool piece of like theater that I found that like, I'm like, uh, I don't care. Can we just <laughs> hang out? And I'm like, no, look at acting. <laughs> I hope you get to watch it again. If you need I, it, I have. I, I mean, think I have. I have a copy that I can send to you of. Oh, of that actually, um, would be nice because I don't think I yeah. have it anymore. I think it's on. I think I. Uh, maybe I moved it onto something. I can't remember. I, I feel like I have it somewhere, but I'm not really sure at this point. It's like <laughs> a, a vagrant MP4 file that's like sitting somewhere on on some kind of hard drive. Um, it yeah, it really is like <laughs> that. Um. Anyway. Thank you so much for hanging out with me today. That was this has been yeah, this really, fun. really fun. Um, uh, and I will let you go because I know you have a meeting in about three minutes. <laughs> gotta run. I uh, gotta run. Um, uh, and thank you to everybody for watching. Do all the things, subscribe, comment, all of that stuff, share with your friends, yada yada yada. Rate <laughs> us on Spotify, etc. Um, but yeah, we'll be Lily will be back next week. Um, I think we have an interview lined up, so that'll be very cool. Um uh, and watch movies. There you go. Woo!